Hi, everyone. This is Sonal. Welcome to the A6NZ podcast. I'm here today with Tim Schaefer of Double Fine Productions. Tim is the CEO and co-founder of Double Fine, which just put out Broken Age, which was a massively crowdfunded game on Kickstarter. Massively oh, crowdfunded. I like that. It was. Wasn't it like the first, actually the first million dollar game or something like that? It was like, what are, our, what are the things that we had records in? We had like the most number. Most backers. Most backers. It was like fastest to a million. Two million bucks. And it was like most exciting thing that happened ever. <laughs> At least as far as I'm concerned. Well, and the way I know you is as the inventor of Grim Fandango, which oh, is aging yeah. myself, but that's what I know about you in the no, gaming it's, space. No, it's really recent. We just remastered it. Okay. And I'm here with Justin, who's the chief operating officer of the COO of Double Fine. Hello. And I'm here with Herman Nerola, the CEO of Improbable, that full disclosure we're investors in. Hi, Herman. Hello. We thought it'd be great to do a podcast on trends in gaming. So we just want to let you guys talk. And let's start off by just talking about the funding landscape, because I think that's one of the first things that comes to mind. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, I um, people often ask, like, what are you excited about in games? And, like, what technology? Like, are there any of these new devices? And, and there are a lot of, you know, new things going on, VR and, and stuff. But I'm always, lately I've been most excited by the, how things have changed as far as business goes, which sounds weird, because I've always been on the creative side of things. But... You know, what happened with us in crowdfunding has allowed us to have uh, just so much more creative control and a, a more natural relationship with with people who we make games for because they're they're funding our games and we're directly in contact with them. They really feel like they're participating in making the game because they help fund it and they're they're big champions of the game and they get to see, you know, behind the curtain a little bit. So it's it's really changed compared to the old days where we would have to deal with a large, like, uh, gatekeeper, a big large company who was like just trying to avoid risk and trying to you know change our games creatively and now we're much more in control of that so i guess that's the thing going on in games it's strange that the the funding kind of revolution that's been going on has been having a huge impact on creativity i I think it's had a huge impact on the technology side as well um you know for us for example working with game developers we're increasingly interested in working with independent game developers because they have such huge followings distinct from large businesses and they have an ability i mean like like dean hall for example who are working with they have an ability to command a following and monetize that following in a way that previously they would have to have gone through a big publisher um, to do. I mean, that's profound. And I think technological innovation that makes games easier to build or quicker to build or widens the scope of what small teams can do may be quite important in the near future. Yeah, and I see a historical uh, precedent actually being set here. If you actually look at what happened about 40 years ago um, in films, you'll actually see film financing came about then, and the creators were freed from a studio framework. And it's really interesting to see what's actually happening right now with crowdfunding and other funding sources and games. Um, because it's creating those same dynamics that, you know, led to basically a creative explosion. And how is it different from the music industry? Because a lot of people have a lot of, like, PTSD from the music industry. Like, they come they come out, they start, you have to have your, it almost seems like a precondition is you have to have your own following to really do indie games successfully. Like, is that true? Can people really become successful if they don't already have their following? I mean, it's happened, following? Right? Yeah. I mean that's how it happens things, all the time. Yeah, just so like a, a really great game can grab everyone's attention that, you know, like, or sometimes just a, a shot of a game like Hyperlight Drifter or something I've never seen before. I didn't know the team, never heard of these guys. Just like, what is that? I want to see that. I want to back that. And, and mm-hmm. you know, in my case, you know, having many years of experience and, you know, years to, like, generate that kind of following definitely helped have a really big Kickstarter. But not everyone needs to, you know, have 3.3 million right off the bat in their first game, right? So I think it's it's a great natural self-correcting method to actually build that kind of following. And, and yet I do think that it is a little bit of a myth that like with crowdfunding, a lot of people think that if you go there, um, you know, with the, you know, the current platforms that are in place, that organic discovery is fairly large. And we've actually found um, that to be quite to the contrary. And you do need to come with your community. A lot of the, the platforms that exist today are about organizing your community um, around a single funding event. Um, the other thing is, it's, it's interesting to note, if you're actually looking at the landscape, um, you know, the barriers to entry have like just come down, which is great, but there's actually more access to more people than ever before. And so there's like a new barrier that, is, that has come about, which um, is discovery. And it's very hard when you're an indie and, and you're very talented uh, to get discovered these days. It, it almost suggests a new model for the publisher, like following on from what you were saying. I mean, where the real role is around discovery, it's around aiding community interaction, it's around magnifying what independents like yourself are already doing um, for new talent as opposed to being this kind of controlling influence that sort of 
swallow up the studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would agree. Like, if you go back to that 40 years ago, that actually was right around the time when EA was being formed. Um, you had Trip Hawkins, and he went out and he found, and this actually ties in the music industry, like, he got the contract from the music industry and used the same practices, um, which have basically have been business practices established for the last 40 years in the game industry. Um, that was the same time, by the way, that the film financing piece was happening. And so um, you kind of saw uh, the creatives in the game industry potentially being more restricted. Um, and those restrictions are falling away now. Um, where the film industry, you've seen, you know, the term auteur came um, from that time frame. Um, and a lot of the most dominant franchises and uh, the creatives being in control now of the studio framework, really, um, has come about from that time. So walk us down a little bit more to why this really matters for people who aren't inside the gaming industry. Like, what does it mean when you give power back to the creators? Definitely something you should answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it leads to uh, uh, the, the best work and I think the health of the industry. Like, look at something like uh, Sundance Film Festival. And uh, it's not like Sundance ex appeared and crushed all the studios and destroyed Hollywood forever. It actually just enriched the whole ecosystem. So you know you had a new a new place to discover um, up and coming artists or pe returning artists, but uh, different kinds of movies were shown there. And those people could also work in Hollywood and kind of just add new ideas to it. In the same way, the indie game market, I think, you know, might make smaller games than the AAA developers, but they're kind of going out in the direction of new new genres and new. Um, New ideas. Like, there was no, you know, I don't think a, a AAA studio would have created Minecraft, for example, you know, and I don't think that followed any sort of rules that existed before it, you know, but I think when um, people have the ability to to kind of make these smaller, personal, more risky projects, um, just it opens up, it continues to grow. Um, the creativity, I think, always leads, and then the, 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 the players follow, and then people um, with money see that, wow, hey, look, everyone's going over there, and... Um, wants to help that grow even bigger. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's almost like a kind of Cambrian explosion of, uh, of new possibilities and ideas. I mean, the one thing as a gamer, as a big fan of some of your games as well, that I've really, uh, you know, hated in the last few years has been the sameness and lack of risk around so many of the higher budget productions that are out there. I mean, still deeply entertaining and fun, but the interesting thing about this industry is you don't really grow out of it. Um, you know, the average age is what, like 36 now of a gamer? Mm -hmm. So these are the same eyeballs. And, you know, there's something weird happening here where they, they want more, they want more variety. So mm -hmm. I think there's quite a voracious appetite out there um, mm -hmm. for the new plethora of uh, perhaps less risky independent projects or more risky creatively, less risky financially now mm -hmm. um, that are going to be available. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious also on your thoughts, Tim, on whether you feel that the mobile user base, the kind of new generation gamers who maybe were never part of the last 20 years of gaming history, are they going to be fundamentally different in what they want from uh, the current <coughs> like more insular gaming community or are they going to be the same? I mean, I hope so. I hope they're different in that uh, I think um, a lot of people had an idea that gamers mean a certain, it means a certain thing. Um, just because it's been that way for a long time. And I think the new people who've been brought in the market are showing something that it kind of highlights the difference to me between games and movies. When you go to a multiplex, uh, there's a movie for everybody. There's like a, there's like a movie your parents will go see, there's a movie the kids will go see, there's a movie the teenagers will go see, and there's, there's, um, there's comedies and dramas, and they're still pretty mainstream, right? It's not like you don't have to go to an art house to see that sort of um, variety. But in games, the, in mainstream games, you still have, for the majority sense, like, summer action blockbusters. They're mostly all in that genre, if you, you know, and I think indie games kind of, you know, stretched out of that for sure. But um, just the, the, the idea that, that, um, that people, you know, the idea of a comedy, that's not a big common thing you see in games, like a comedy game. Exactly. And, a, you know, definitely not a romance. It's not a very common thing. They exist, but they're not that common. I think that, that shows that um, when new people come in through, you know, casual gaming or mobile gaming, um, they don't have those same assumptions that everybody wants to play a certain type of game. And, and they, I think it's kind of rough sometimes for the people who are in that existing community to feel it changing and feeling like new people are joining the club. And I think it you know, makes them kind of angry sometimes. But I think in general, it'll, it'll just keep growing and that's healthy for, for everybody. C completely. And I, I agree. I also think it's kind of a gateway drug. Uh, I think that <laughs> you know, people playing Clash of Clans today, even Clash of Clans is more sophisticated than mobile experiences that came before. I mean, I remember Snake. I don't know if anyone else does back in the day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, you know, when they want more, what do they do? And we had a very interesting little anecdotal story. A lot of people had previously played mobile games. And one of the requirements was to download the game from Steam in order to interact with it. Um, these weren't like hardcore gamers. Just the click process in Steam mm. was utterly alien to them. I mean, mm -hmm. these are people that have used the iPhone store, right? So they were really used to a very slick experience. And they were instantly like thrown 
by trying to interact with this game. It was like an alien world to them, you know, like people who used to Amazon or, or iTunes. So there's a sort of adolescence to some of the non-creative parts of the industry, which um, needs to evolve if those people are to be brought into the fold. What are some of the other changes besides mobile that are changing the gaming landscape for you guys as creators and producers of games? Um, I think like that diversity of people trying new things, I think is changing a lot. People realizing that it's okay to have narrative in games again. I think for years, I, when I first started playing, it was like text adventures. I love playing these games that would tell you you're in the middle of a field, there's a white house to the north. You know, these text events, you type in, go north. Um, and it, we made adventure games all through the 90s that were all about like, you know, pirates and bikers and tentacles and all sorts of um, stories. And, um, and I think then within the gaming community, there was a feeling of like, we should do these, you know, non-scripted things that are just you know, systemic based where you make your own story by, you know, you know, um, finding these emergent type behaviors and kind of scripted stories were kind of had a kind of a bad rap for a while. And I think things like um, The Last of Us and Home Alone and games have come out where story is so strong and people are realizing that it, it, you can have both. You can have both emergent things happening in games. You can have games across a whole spectrum of really scripted story-based things to really just uh, emergent type Minecraft things. And now they're doing a story-based version of Minecraft. So it's like everywhere in between. It's just basically a safe. I think it's safe to explore the whole spectrum now, which I think is a, a positive step. I mean, um, our passion, like full disclosure, is in building massive emergent online experiences, right? And it's funny that you mentioned that you know it's okay to tell stories again. <laughs> I think going even further, I think people who play online games in those communities, they want to tell stories and be part of stories. You know, there, there can be a very same equality to online experiences. You know, you play something like Grim Fandango and you're like, you go on an emotional journey, right? You don't with um, a game where all the content is static. So how to bring the teeming mass of online gamers to the same kind of emotional experiences that they get from really good uh, single player experiences is a really hard challenge too. Um, and I think the focus on VR and graphics, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think that I think that graphics are not the be-all and end-all of gaming experience. I think there's more fundamental components to engagement that I wish people would explore more, which aren't as flashy as just increasing pixel density. And I mean, it's, it's why like people like Tim and others are so enduring in their ability to produce great games. There must be something fundamental that crosses medium, that crosses audience, which you know needs to be explored. Yeah, right? and, and I think it was what Tim was talking about too, is the, the story side of things. And one thing I think is interesting that's going to happen here is you have, uh, you know, we talked about mobile, but VR, which yeah. you were just alluding to. Um, and what that does uh, to the gaming landscape, which I'm really excited about, because a lot of the uh, same things that actually worked and the same techniques and uh, with Hollywood films and these big blockbuster games, like they just don't translate over uh, to the VR experience, which, uh, you know, I think potentially you'll see a spotlight on things like narrative and exploration, um, which do translate to that medium. And I think it's something interesting to hear, you know, what Tim's take on, on it is. Well, I, I think it's interesting because the, I guess beyond story and gameplay, all these things to me are um, part of this toolkit to, to do one thing, which is the thing I like to do most in games, which is just pull someone into a world. Just pull someone until they forget they're sitting on the couch or wherever they are, and they're just in this world. The characters feel real to them. The problems of the world become their problems, and the you know the beauty of the world. They just they feel like they're just transported into it. And they never want to leave. I mean, they you know want them to leave and go have uh, dinner and stuff like that. But they miss it. You know, I feeling when you're playing a really great game and you're at school or work and you're just I can't wait to go back to that world and so on. Because I feel like um, there's something there is something really positive about just going to a fantasy world and getting lost in that. It's like a mental. Um, transformation. And I, I think, um, you know, VR just has a lot of potential, obviously, for tell, making you feel like you're in another place, but you were physically in another place. And you're really, really there. And there's um, a lot of potential for that, for sure. And it's kind of interesting, too, because you're talking about like the gateway drug, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, is VR like the farthest you can get away from the gateway drug? Because you're, you're strapping something on your head. Yes. See, and that's, that's, that's really, really interesting. I, I completely agree. I think deepening the experience in other ways is, is important. But I think that the fundamental threshold is those things are all periphery. They're very important. But the fundamental threshold is, am I engaged with what I'm interacting with? Am I emotionally, personally, mentally engaged? And that boils down to, in my view, this is just my opinion, on what that content is and what the fundamentals of that experience are. And I think when people try and paper that over with better graphics or with something superficially more immersive, mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't fix that flaw. Like, and that, I think, to really explore what will work in new mediums requires exactly what you guys are talking about, way more experimentation, which is in turn enabled by... Uh, better funding models and more people trying new things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and you're right; the old stuff won't work. Um, you know, even in online, like look at Daisy. I mean, that was 
what the hell was that, right? You know, I mean, that was <laughs> that was a whole new experience. I mean, that's yeah. another thing I just love on the business side. So a little bit of a tangent here, but if you went to Steam, which you talked about earlier, and how um, so Daisy is probably uh, one of those properties that's performed really well in Steam. It's a little inaccessible to most people, but if you went onto that place to buy it, you actually saw the description that was like on all caps that looked like lawyer speak, <laughs> which is basically do not buy this yeah. game. Like it, it's buggy, it's not finished, it's unpolished, like. Don't get involved. So, so they did incredibly well in the Steam sale. No, they, they did actually, something they that's never on, happened. They weren't even on sale. Yeah. Like, it's got a really strange word of mouth. At there was something that's never happened in the history of the Steam sale, which was, it was the holiday side. It was like the Christmas sale. Yeah. And for the whole sale, they stayed the number one yeah, spot. Yeah, this is this is what uh, what he was telling us. I mean, like, so working, working with him now, and like one of the interesting points about that game is what was it that kept people there? Like, the Arma engine, you know, he'd be the first to say was not, wouldn't have been necessarily his first choice like you know and the development methodology of the game and the and, and kind of from a, from a bug and development perspective it was a challenging project to do so, I mean, but it was unbelievably engaging right yeah like, and there's something really cool there which is um, which I'm still trying to figure out from just a business side yeah. of like opportunities and stuff but if you look at Dota was basically a mod as yeah. well, which became League of Legends. And you look at you know this um, from Arma, and this is like DayZ. It's like this mod community that grabs something and makes it something bigger. It's really interesting. Yeah, I'd agree totally. I mean, we we started, I don't know what, what you feel about this, Tim, but we started this sort of radical paradigm internally, which is we think for now, like all the development teams experimenting with us, they're all modding versions of code bases that made up earlier games built on improbable. So our whole tech is based around the idea that there's not really any difference between a game developer and a modder. They're both manipulating uh, a shared code base that they can keep adding to. So you get these really strange variations of products that are in development that just kind of spin out in our team. Everyone's always game jamming and riffing on what's being well, built. Well, it's also like they yeah. can actually take a chance. Yeah, the exactly. Mod- the modders yeah. can. Because it's so easy to build exactly. something. Yeah. And yeah. they're not tied to a commercial model. And it's like it's not the same publishing model where it's like they can't take risks. They have to sit there and plug the same franchise. They have to do proven mechanics. And the expectations are different too. If, if Ubisoft had come out and released DayZ, and been like, here it is. People would have treated them, I think, differently. Yeah, <laughs> completely. Yeah, but it um, it, it was like um, it shows how I mean, modding is a great example of putting tools in the hands of a lot of people, and it shows how you know the next great idea. It's really hard to to ensure that it's in the right place, like in your company. Yeah. It's like it might be out in the wild somewhere, and whoever you know made the right mod to that game, and all of a sudden created a new genre, like they did with um, completely yeah, and defender defense of the age. And the core risk, of, you know, imagine that game. You die, and you're permanently dead. And when you meet people, you know, there's this choice. I mean, you see people streaming reaction shots of experiences they've had in the game. These are real experiences. I mean, they created a game right. Yeah, it created things in the players that they wanted to talk about completely, people, which yeah. I think is how things get um, promoted these days. It's just everyone talking about it. Kind of, it used to be called water coolers, but I think it's obviously just YouTube streams. And- exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, it left an effect on you, and it was an effect that was yours and unique. I remember... Um, I was one of those bad people that uh, I'm going to confess that I uh, I played Daisy and I uh, force fed rotten meat to people. It's not not quite like that. I mean, I was actually helped by this nice group of people, and I just decided their stuff looked really shiny, and you know the game is quite laborious. So I brutally murdered them with a shovel, right? And Good it was. To know. However, it was like an, <laughs> it was. I thought it would just be a game, and like who cares, right? But at the end of that experience, you actually felt awful, like absolutely awful. And there were these people that were like, why we helped you? Like, why have you done this? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> It's, and it, you don't get that, um, you know, in an experience which is cookie cutter or where, you know, the player engagement and that core, your choices are not being valued, you know? It sounds really bad, but I feel like that's, just, that's one of the valuable things about games that people don't talk about a lot, which is experimenting with morality and behavior, like little kids do. Like, you're playing games, and you know, you do something mean to someone, and then you're like, you didn't, I didn't like how that felt. I felt weird when they asked me why I did that, you know, like, uh, yeah, I you know, like, it, you know, I think it's really great that kids play these games and they role play emotional situations or moral situations and they test out how it feels to misbehave or be bad or be the bad guy and they kind of make a choice if they liked it or they didn't like it. You know, you, I don't know if you'd be more likely to uh, steal someone's food in the future. No, believe I me. I mean, after seeing what a shovel murder really looks like, I'm, <laughs> I'm off them for life. It's not going to be any of those. So l- let's talk a little bit more about this element of moral and ethical components to gaming. I think that's actually really interesting and we should pull on that thread a little I mean, bit more. Moral choices, any choice, right? Like the question is, are they authentic choices? You know, mm. most games don't, I mean, many games don't give people authentic choices. The ones that are authentic mm. are the ones that they want. They're really they give this really obvious choice of like, you found a puppy, do you kill it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or do you <laughs> harvest it for its blood or do you <laughs> raise it so it becomes the king of all puppies? Yeah, and, and one, one choice is always like, this is definitely better, like, yeah. you know, in every way. And oh, by the way, please click this button here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
But I think, yeah, it's not about the games preaching a certain moral tone yeah. to the players. It's right. about you probably, if you provide that kind of either sandbox or a structured experience, you can let them play. Like like I was saying, um, little kids, when they play cops and robbers or any sort of like pretend role-playing the kids do, um, is them exploring, you know, what is it like for me to be uh, a powerful character or a weaker character or just someone in a certain situation I can't be in real life? And then what would I do if I was that, if I, if I, if I was uh, invisible or could fly? Like, what would I use it for good? And let me try using it for bad. And like, you, I, it's, it's great that kids can try out these things. Like, I have a daughter and she's, she just turned seven. And sometimes I, I hear her being mean to her dolls. And I used to be like, are you crazy? Are you going to be like an evil villain when you grow up? <laughs> and I, I can tell that she is just like exploring things that are hard to do in real life. Like you don't want to actually be mean to people or, you know, but she's interested in the range of, you know, what happens if you try these things. And I think uh, when kids play with dolls that they figure out through role playing what it feels like and they get this kind of emotional practice. And I think all sorts of play does this, including video games. And video games can just do it in a way that is really interesting and has a whole bunch of new potential. And anything that we can do as technologists or developers to try and help people make and create more authentic choices and options in games is important, right? Like if you're really going to rob someone, there should be a reaction in the world. Um, you know, if you're, you know, there should be consequences to your actions. And at least in the online game space, that's, I guess, my main preoccupation, trying to make that more possible. Because you did benefit by shoveling those people. Right? You got stuff. <laughs> yeah, but also and it, the it game a... didn't tell you right or wrong. The game didn't be like, oh, you horrible. No, person. it didn't. And that was, but it was a real thought. I probably thought about that choice in that game more than I think any choice I've thought about in any game I've ever made since then. And it's an experience that was entirely uniquely mine. And when I went to talk to people about it, they had their own advice, but they didn't have the exact same choice, right? right. It was like a it was a unique moment. Yeah, that, um, that's one of those like Minecraft things too that um, came up with Minecraft. It's like that first night you have to build yeah. a structure and then the zombies come out. Exactly. And like that was the first experience people had. It's like, well, what was that like that first night for you? Yeah, exactly. But and then, and, and it would have been slightly different each time depending upon where they were. Right. So for me, that's that's it. I think, that yeah. the magic future is one where you know we can do exactly what Tim says, right? Which is have a have a world where you're exploring authentic choices, be they moral or otherwise, and whatever it takes to make those choices more authentic. If it's putting on a VR headset, or if it's uh, you know being in a simulated online world, or if it's just having a really cracking good story. Have you ever considered like a system based game or more like online or something? You know, yeah. Scope a lot. Life. I mean, especially after making an adventure game, I was kind of like, oh, now I remember why I stopped making those. Those are so hard to make because every everything is is a one off single like single use thing. You work for three months on something, it'll take the player ten minutes to experience. And like, ah, I, I see the benefit of leveraging things the other ways. So like, you know, you work on something for you know, like an hour that takes someone like a day to play. Yeah, it's, it's been a big thing for us too, like uh, trying to save as much time to the developers as possible. And each bit of gameplay, like they introduce the idea of surgery and they introduce the idea of like uh, electrocution. They just create loads of moments, right? Because that, that effort of a week of coding that is then months of potential variation. So yeah. I yeah, th th I worry about this though, because this is um, this so is that's one That's a very piece. extreme example. Like well, no, went, no, it's, it's completely it's, crazy. It, but it's the system yeah. versus content based games and it's like in the consumer's mind it's like you know um, what are we basically doing there um, is when you go and watch a movie you know you pay 12 bucks and that's fine but when you pay like um, and that's for a two hour experience but when you actually go and play a system based game you can play it for almost infinity let's yeah. just say you took a, you know, 120 hours 160 hours and you're like your, expect, your expectation then is there's a cost associated with the play time um, and so it almost makes these experiences content based game experiences um, it sets them up to fail because people are like, oh, well, that should be free when it takes like a crafting of years and to the, get it right. Completely. And there's another worse problem, which is that I think some systems case, games based design can be very lazy, right? Like you're still trying to create a fantasy. You're still trying to create a, something that drives and guides a developer. Um, what I'd love is to take the crafted feeling of a proper fantasy universe or like a proper storyline experience and then combine that with components around system-based experiences, but components are designed to give the game more depth and background, not to kind of pollute the core experience. You know, that's that's something that we'd really love to like explore. I also think that online games have been such a scary bug there to so many uh, potentially fantastic developers, just because of the crazy sunk costs and other stuff. Um, I want to dispel that illusion and let those developers experiment with you know, kick-ass stuff. So let's say this 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 path continues. There's more and more emancipation for developers. There's more and more direct access to the community and there's alternative funding channels that spring up that allow you to kind of really, you know, you could do bigger productions, for example, but with the same uh, the same kind of feel as the things that Double Fine makes right now. What do you think the gaming landscape then looks like? I mean, does it become like the music industry where you've got like Taylor Swift and 
Is Tim Schafer Taylor Swift? How did we get Swift? from Broken Age to Taylor Swift? What was Tim the Schaefer, be Taylor Taylor Swift Swift is, is Tim Schafer the next Taylor Swift in gaming? That's my question. Right? As a result of changing business uh, business production. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it is interesting because one thing we were talking about earlier about modders and indies and like how they get involved is the control aspect. And it's like with indies and with modders, you don't have that control. And that's one thing I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, how, how it will happen, how it will evolve is with when you don't have that, that old model I was talking about in the music industry was all about control over the creators. And like, if you decouple that and now you have access to money yeah. and it's without control and it's letting the creatives actually take that money. Um, and, and, you know, before it's been like, modders don't have money, indies don't have money, but now, you know, studios, like I would... I, Tim has a Tim has a label for this, like Triple I. Is what Triple he I. said. That's cool. Is um, these these studios that exist between indies and Triple A, um, which are like Double Fine, which you know have an existing uh, consumer mm-hmm. consumer base. Would you say that naturally, as a result of being Kickstarter originally funded and having the experience you guys did, that you represent a more efficient model of game development? Is your do you think your capital usage is more efficient than if you were a studio funded company? If, if you're in a studio and you have a bunch of let's say you have a bunch of bands, your music studio. You know not all of them are going to be the Rolling Stones, and the Rolling Stones are going to pay for all the other bands, but you cross-collateralize so that you know they all kind of pay for each other, which is great for you because you've taken the risk because you don't know which band's going to be a hit, and you've taken that risk and spread it out, and overall you know you're going to make money because you have a, a, you know 100 bands signed. But if you're one of those individual bands, you know you're not going to make anything, and you're not going to keep any of your money because you're paying. Even if you make a little bit of money, you're going to be paying for all the other bands, and you see these stories of occasionally a huge band getting rich, and so that kind of keeps the whole system going because like somebody's getting rich. Like it might as well it's like a, like a Vegas thing. Yeah, could be me when I pull that lever. It might be me. So I feel like um, I feel like that is inefficient. At, you know, when you look at it from that side, because you're you're just trying to deal with risk. Um, looking at it from a, a far enough back scale that uh, it, it's not as scary, I guess. But in terms of one person, like you're one band or one game developer and you're going to make one game, you cut out that middleman who's just trying to mitigate their risk of their investment and you get the money directly from the people who accept the risk in that, you know, I don't, you know, Tim's announcing a new adventure game. He hasn't given the title. He hasn't told me anything about it. I don't know if he's still got it. You don't know who knows what's going to happen. But I, I want this. Um, I am a you know I, I'm a you know, high value consumer that knows what they want, and I'm gonna put down thirty five dollars in advance. You know I could lose it all, but I'm gonna put it down because I either either because I believe so much in that person or because I just want it to happen so bad. And they they accept that risk, and I feel like it creates this really kind of like um a bond that is financial, but it's also based on like kind of commitment and passion and all the, all the right things. See, I completely agree with that. And this is where I think technology is important too. Tim, for you, since you've been in the gaming industry so long, like how has that evolved for you? Like the technology platforms, like what's the biggest, I mean, you're, you're at the heart, you're a consummate storyteller. <laughs> so I feel like for you, like that's the primary focus, but like, how has that changed? It's funny. Cause like at the beginning, you know, we're just starting a new project now cause we should ship the last one. And I still go to this, um, spiral notebook and start writing ideas down with a pen it's like so the process is exactly the same for me because it's like kind of it's more of a journey into your own mind and trying to find ideas and and but um i think the biggest change besides the funding models changing is the relationship with the community and how social media has changed that so they all have access to us in a way like when i was a kid i didn't um have any idea how i could get in contact with a guy you know nolan bushnell or like you know I'm like, i love my atari so much i don't know what to do with this i can't go on twitter and be like nolan I, you know. oh, totally. yeah. <laughs> but nowadays you could you can go people can tell me immediately and trust me they do whether they like or don't like the game like the day the second it comes out you'll you'll hear from um you know people of all all the whole spectrum of how they felt about your game and um that's that's something you just have to really like you know we have a full-time community manager to 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 handle that because that could be a great powerful um part of the whole of the whole deal and it could be very dangerous if if you don't you know treat them well and 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 um be honest with them and um, and pay attention to them. You know, sometimes you'll have the angriest person in the world write you a meanest letter, and then you'll just uh, say, "Oh, oh, I'm sorry, you had that issue. Let me try and get that in our bug tracking system." And they're like, "I can't believe you answered." They're so happy that you just listened to them. So just like uh, listening to them uh, um, and interacting with them, and uh, it is definitely a new thing compared to how it was back in the '90s. So that's the biggest change for you. Completely. And, and I guess now more and more, I guess the technology side would be developers can do something about it. Um, even for online games, right? You can you can make changes. You can modify stuff. Mm-hmm. Like there were some people on World's Drift Bosses game, and you know, it's all about systems and physics, but then they had a really samey resource model where like you were actually 
know, going up to a tree or a rock and extracting resources. And people like flamed them, right? They were like, you've built a physics game where you're meant to be able to interact with the world and you have this technology, like why can't you do it? Like a week later, they posted a video of people dynamiting rocks and blowing them up and chopping down physicalized trees. But to be able to do something about it in a week, you know, it feeds that cycle of community uh, members who, you know, and the people, who, the guy who posted the thing, you know, he's like the most, uh, you know, he's a super fan now, right? Like he posts every week, right? Because he's like, wow, you know, I had that interaction. Um, and this is, again, where I think that Taylor Swift uh, analogy is, is less ridiculous, right? Like it, direct fan contact, direct fan responses, you know, that's something that's now possible, never was before. Great, you guys. Thank you.